Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of the Australian Underground Podcast. I just wanted to jump in here before we get into the main chat uh, with my beautiful friend Alexander Black, um, because today we will be touching on some pretty heavy subjects. That's going to be a bit of a somber episode. Um, it might not seem as fun as usual, but um, we believe that this chat is 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 pretty important. Um, of course, we will be chatting about uh, mental illness. Uh, substance abuse um, in our generation, in the music industry, and just Australian culture as a whole. Uh, now, I have to preface that Alexander and I are not experts in this subject. We are not psychologists, but we are experts on our own experiences. Um, we both had dealings with mental illness in the past, substance abuse within our within our families. Um, uh, I, for one, have become a lot more comfortable speaking about my experiences um, uh, in my earlier years. Um, uh, I did uh, end up in hospital uh, a few times. Um, just had some really, really dark moments. Um, and I've kind of been working and, and growing from that ever since and trying to really bounce back. Uh, so I I, I do realize the, the capability that your mind has to, to manifest a twisted reality and, and make you uh, really believe that. Um, the, yeah. Um, I, won't, I won't go into it too much. Um, obviously, if you're, if you're close to me and you're, and you're a friend of mine, you, you might know little hints about what I've gone through, but it's never really something that I have um, gone into much detail. You know, I had the kind of upbringing where it was like barely any females in the house. Um, Mum passed away at an early age. So it was a very male focused upbringing. Um, bless, bless my dad's heart, but he, he wasn't the, the really emotionally in touch type of person. So it was the, uh, it was very much kind of, you know, keep your feelings inside, work it out like a, like a man, so to speak. Um, and it wasn't really until I moved out of home and left the tiny country town that I was in and moved to Adelaide that I, that I really started to, to become more in touch with that side of myself and started to more self-reflect. Um, and it's really only recently that I've actually started to look back on, on those, those moments in my life, uh, and, you know, just try and figure out why I felt that way, the root cause of, of that. And that's something that we, we get into today with today's podcast. Um, just talking about why, yeah, there seems to be a lot of, a lot of young people nowadays who, who have gone through the kind of same stuff that we have gone through. Um, and yes, as I said, we are no experts on this subject, uh, but we are experts on our own experiences um, experts on seeing how our friends are doing and seeing what they're going through and of course what we're going through um, so yeah I, I just wanted to say that it'll be a bit of a heavy heavy podcast today and it might not be for everyone but uh, we thought this was important to get out and talk about this uh, and, and personally I thought this was great therapy for me to, to talk about this and um and Alexander is such a wonderful person. Uh, he makes some beautiful music. And, and ever since I've met him, I've, uh, he's just been one of those people that I felt really comfortable talking to and, and, and just talking about everything, um, not just music, but, you know, personal feelings and, and just, you know, the struggle of being a, a young person uh, in this day and age. And, you know, don't, don't listen to your parents or your grandparents I'm young, I get it. it. It can be really difficult at times. Um, you know, it's a sick, sad world we live in and we're all just trying to figure out how to get through it. Uh, so with that being said, um, yeah, I'll stop ranting now and, and we'll jump into this very important podcast episode, uh, I think. Um, as I have said previously, we're trying to really uh, broach on some important subjects with this podcast. It's not just, you know, jumping on here and talking about our, our favorite musicians and, uh, and our favorite gigs and whatnot. We're 
so yeah, I, I really hope uh, everyone enjoys this podcast and, and you get something out of it. Um, that, that's the main thing. I don't just want you to enjoy this episode. I, I really hope that you take something away from it. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put some links uh, and some sources in the description of this podcast. Um, and hopefully some actual helpful links, not just the, you know, copy and paste lifeline number that everyone seems to do. Um, but, you know, no, no shade against that. But, you know, calling up and speaking to someone on the phone is, is not for everyone. Um, some people, yeah, like me, you just get sick of talking about your problems and you just want to get in and fix it. Um, kind of what we're doing with this, with this episode here today. Um, so without further ado, please enjoy this uh, fourth episode, I believe, of the Australian Underground Podcast with my wonderful friend, Mr. Alexander Black. Enjoy. Because I've got my own shit I'm dealing with. And all my friends are sad. There we go. Mr. Alexander Black, welcome to the podcast. Absolute pleasure to have you here. I haven't seen seen you in a bit, so it's good to see your face again. It has. It's been a long while, hasn't it? I'm here. I'm alive. Brilliant. Um, Yeah. Well, first thing I want to ask you is like, how, how have you been doing mentally during the whole lockdown and everything? I think I'm like, I've done like, amazingly i think um i like i was definitely like you know i had lots of plans like everyone else this year and i was like i'm gonna do all this cool stuff and then it all happened and i was like okay this is like a gift for me because like uh especially like me and a few other people like in the bands we play in we just like we work so hard all the time and we do so many things we were just like actually this might be quite a blessing to just like go to sleep for a little while, you know, and just like have a good break and like relax a bit. And like, you don't get FOMO because everyone else had to miss out as well. (laughs) That's one of the things like everyone else gets to share the pain. Um, But that's that's how I've been looking at it. Yeah. Um, Yeah, it's the only thing that keeps me from being like, oh, other people have it better than me. But actually when it came to this whole situation i was like actually i have like so much privilege in this situation that i have to like check first and be like okay cool like i live in a house yeah. and i can still pay rent and uh all of these things are all looked after and if the government wants to tell me to go sit in my house for four months because it's good for the country then i can understand that as being like a public good that is not even that very hard to do you know yeah and you're not being like, oppressed or anything like no yeah. and like literally my life didn't change like besides gigs my life didn't change at all because i yeah. like i still went went to the shops and got food and you know came home and every once in a while you say hi to friends whatever and that's like that's about it you know um and i was like this is not different at all you know yeah well i know i know personally i've been i think the first few weeks were a bit rocky i was like oh crap what's happening you know we can't put mm. gigs on we can't cover any 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 gigs yeah. or anything but then i i kind of uh, tried to see the positives in it um yeah. and did a bit of self-reflection and That's good. And, and, and definitely yeah tried to just look at the positives otherwise you're just going to get yourself down yeah definitely which is with everything else happening in the world you know it's you know a lot of stuff to get down about so yeah well, that's the thing. Yeah, there's so much. Yeah, there's so much else that's way worse than my situation. Mm. That I have to just be like, well, I, I definitely don't have it as bad as because you just read all the stuff, you know, and you hear about like obviously that the government has put in place like safety mechanisms, you know, not really by choice. Yeah, um, yeah. they've been forced to do it because they they definitely don't want to do it. Like they don't want to help people really, but they yeah. have to. <laughs> 
in this situation they're like oh we, we actually have to do something and it's like cool yeah, yeah you better do it and then they obviously like they leave a bunch of people out you know so you hear people are like yeah i'd still have to work or um i have to you know it's really hard for certain people and you're just like why doesn't this safety mechanism cover everyone you know why can't everyone yeah. you know be looked after in this situation exactly uh, yeah uh, um yeah so so today we're chatting about so we're going to chat about um kind of mental mental illness how that's how that's affecting everyone around our generation everyone in the in the industry um but also also substance abuse um as well because I've, I've found um you know through my own experiences and then seeing my friends and everything that it it seems to be a a bit of a common thing in at least our industry um i'm not sure why but you know the, the the journey of trying to be an artist seems to be a bit of a hard one um what's what, what is your personal experience with with kind of seeing that in the in the local scene well as like by the time i kind of was getting into gigs when i was around like 18 or 19 anyway i had kind of already been through an experience of um like understanding what like drinking did to like a family unit like yeah um yeah. in my own family and seeing what that did and so like i had already i had already started drinking when i was like 14 or something like that which yeah, is same, like it's n it's not yeah it's not a very not uncommon good. thing in this country you know yeah but i i it happened for me less like this is uh upon reflection of years and years and years of me being like okay i actually didn't i didn't go to parties when i was like 14 or 15 like with friends in high school i was like drinking with my brother who was like quite a bit like he's nine years older than i am yeah and it was just kind of me and him and we were just kind of hanging out we play music and and uh yeah he, he taught me how to drink you know and uh and then i i kind of realized that like yeah that's a part of what i was seeing in like a family unit and the way it affected everyone else in the family and where his addictions affected him and affected everyone else around him but i was like this is not the experience that a lot of people when they are drinking and having fun get to have that yeah. makes sense yeah so i didn't get to do much of like just because i um i had friends who were like partying and stuff like that but it was my brother lived like a far like far enough away from me that it was kind of just like you can like leave your parents and like go and go and drink or whatever and it's like you don't have to be too close to the situation so it kind of yeah. like you know um rather than being like in the same suburb or whatever it was like you know i lived up north and my brother lived down south yeah. so it was completely like going to a different universe and like you know doing all this yeah like crazy stuff and then it kind of just showed me yeah the way that it like deteriorates the family like unit in, in all these different relationships and i was like okay so lots of other people don't get that kind of experience when they go into because yeah when they go into gigs they kind of they bring all their friends with them and it becomes like the same kind of social culture that just like means that like oh you're 18 now and the beers and everything are all free you know yeah yeah so it's kind of just as like yeah you can have everything you want like you can have all the beers you want on the rider and you can and it's kind of like it's made for the evolution of you as a like a young man into a an adult yeah like the system is just like okay cool like you already know how to drink we know that we you're a binge drinker already pretty much like now just like play music and then fit that into your whole like social situation so um i had already kind of stopped drinking by the time i started to go to gigs and i don't know i was just like it just becomes like an anomaly that you realize that you're automatically like different than everyone else but you have to kind of have a good like in this country um you have to have like a good reason for it you know or yeah something like that you know they have to be like oh so why like you have like a is it a medical thing or if you're driving or yeah something like that and you're just like i don't know i just stopped because i understood that it wasn't going to be something i wanted to do in my life you know? yeah yeah so, that's yeah that's strange that's strangely uh strangely similar to my story of you know, a bit of bit of uh alcohol abuse in the family so you know when i was yeah got to that you know 18 19 age you know i 
I did I realized how it can break down a family unit. Um, I mean, my parents got divorced over it. Um, so right. that's uh, very much a, a big thing. And yeah, during my, my teenage years, you know, I'd, you know, dad was really strict. So I'd, you know, try and escape the house at any chance possible and then go to my mate's place and get paralytic. And I, and I didn't think that was a bad thing for a long time. I thought that was everyone's doing it. You know, it's, yeah. it must be normal. It's part of the culture. Exactly. Um, yeah. And that's, yeah, the whole that it's part of the culture. We have such a drinking culture here. And I think that's one of the big problems, like bands getting paid um, in beers. I think yeah. is, is crazy. I've, I've got mates who, you know, who, who clearly have a problem and they're getting paid in beers all the time. And it's like, mm. you know, it's a bit, it's a bit much. Um, yeah. yeah. It just shows how much it's part of the culture here. Yeah, definitely. It's and good. it's not just like, uh, it's not just like having a few drinks or something, you know, mm. it's, it's binge drinking is what we learn how yeah. to do. Like my only idea of what alcohol was, was to like completely fuck you up. Like, yeah, that was the point of it. It wasn't to like enjoy it. It was to get it inside of you as quickly as possible mm. and for it to like make your face numb. Like that was yeah. pretty much like, and I was like, okay, cool. Like I understand what that is. There are repercussions, you know, like physical repercussions straight away, like the day afterwards and all that. And then all the, you know, shitty things you might do or say, but they're mm. all the good, like the good memories that you have too. So if you can remember them. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. But um, yeah, there's never any kind of like, I don't know, older people seem to be like, um, seem to have this idea of it being classy or something like that, but they use that as the kind of excuse. Um, um, yeah. A mask and an excuse yeah. to be like, I'll get fucked up, but I'll pretend like I'm drinking something that's like a bit nicer, but only cause I can afford it or something, you know? Yeah. Drinking like, gin uh, or whatever. Yeah. For a few years I lived at like a residential college and that's like, it's, it's not exactly like American college or whatever like that, yeah. but it's similar in the way that, yeah, you've got like study and then like social life happening like kind, of, kind of all at the same time. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, every, yeah, like every Thursday they had like pub night and that was like go to a different pub and mm. it was part of like socializing or whatever, but, um, and everyone would just, yeah, get slaughtered, you know, and that was just like the game, you know. Yeah. And part of it teaches you there's like a, a lack of responsibility that you have to like account for as well, because like, um, one of my like distinct memories, like kind of on my, maybe my, my third year or something, which was my last year of kind of like, you have like I had uni on Friday morning or something like that. And it's like, okay, cool. We have like communal bathrooms. Um, and it's kind of like a, yeah, like there's showers and communal bathroom and stuff. And you kind of just walk in there and someone's just like chucked all over the toilet or whatever. <laughs> and you're just like, cool. Someone had a great night and it's uh, like, we're all adults here, but I have to like, I have to deal with that in the mm. morning. I have to deal with that shit. And it's like, I didn't have anything to do with that. I'm trying to be responsible for myself. And there's a kind of just like, ah, oh, you know, the cleaners will fix it and whatever. And you don't have to be responsible for your actions, you know, in a certain yeah. way. And they had like, uh, yeah, they had wine and cheese nights and stuff where they'd have some dude who was, you know, from some winery or something like that. And he'd bring in all this wine and be like, oh, wine and cheese and blah, blah, blah. And then like everyone just gets fucked up, you know? <laughs> yeah. And it's like, even on that kind of stuff. Did they like try and be like, yes, this is, you know, um, yeah, very like uh, cultured experience or whatever. And you're like, okay, cool. But no one <laughs> really takes that seriously. You know? Yeah. I, I remember one situation I did a, um, uh, cause, cause it's rampant within the hospitality industry as well. Um, right. drinking and, and substance use and everything. Mm. Um, I remember one time I did like a, a trial shift at, um, at some upscale uh, restaurant in the city. And um, after we were finished, um, you know, the staff that were still there all gathered around a table and we, and we, and we drank all the leftover wine that was mm. opened. And obviously they couldn't, for some reason, you know, they couldn't serve it the next day. So like the whole staff there, and it's like, you know, people from age, you know, 20 to 40 yeah. and, and we just binge all this wine and then we stagger out um, 
and I thought, you know, that was crazy. And then I think I, I, I ended that night, you know, puking on some side street somewhere in the CBD, um, random strangers walking past me, ordering taxis for me, but I couldn't get in because I was still puking. And it was like, that, that was one of the nights where I look back on it and I'm like, yeah, that's definitely a part of a problem that I wasn't addressing at the time. Um, but, right, yeah. But it, yeah, it shows that, I mean, yeah, it's obviously not just music, but it's like, I guess every single, every industry, you know, you, you clock off work and the, mm. the, the go-to activity is to get sloshed. Um, exactly. And try and forget the shift that you just had. Um, yeah. It's kind so of think, like a, yeah. I think that's an issue, right? Like, there. It's this feature of, I guess it's capitalism or whatever it is that drives the idea. Like, it, you know, it was the, like the 40 hour work week, mm. you know, and then you have this, yeah, this time. And then because as, as you know, conditions might get worse or you get treated more like shit um, as an employee or something like mm. that, of course you're going to be like, the first thing I want to do is yeah, forget exactly what I've just done because yeah. I fucking hate it. And then I'm going to try and, you know, get my way through the weekend doing that and then right back again, you know, on Monday and you roll in, you know, it makes yeah. sense, you know, that people want to, want to find, you know, want to find that. And it's so like ubiquitous in our culture. Like it's through, it's through everything. It's through sport and it's through music and it's, yeah. you know, so all those parts of like things that you would see as like community, like recreation and, um, things that are just like good for you like music is playing music is great for you like yeah and playing yeah. sport is like good for you but then there's like a, an idea that like it's kind of yeah they leech onto that and it's like everything has to be sponsored by some beer thing yeah or whatever and some betting thing and it all just like it becomes like yeah like soiled to a degree that you're like okay someone's just trying to really like benefit out of the idea that someone doesn't just think oh yeah i'll just enjoy music for what it is it has to have that extra component to it yeah yeah well you know like um yeah like uh like marijuana is like uh taught has been tied in with the music industry since you know the 50s mm. um and then you know everything else that comes of that it's just um yeah it, it just seems to be so intertwined with with artistry and and, and everything and it's you know kind of scary um for example uh keith urban um back in the 90s he he was a, a bona fide crackhead um i just I, I read a book i just finished a book recently just talking about um australian artists that, that went international and made it big um and yeah there's a little excerpt excerpt in there from um keith urban uh, where he recalls one night where he was crawling around his hotel room trying to find crack rocks on the ground. Um, and and to go from that to where he is now is is I mean that that's a success story right there, but there's a lot of there's mm. a lot of stories that aren't success stories. Yeah. Um, uh, I did an interview with um, uh, Mr. Mr. Dick Dale, who's a filmmaker here in Adelaide and an old punk. Uh, and he was around in the 80s and 90s in, in the punk scenes in Melbourne and Sydney. And and he talked about how heroin use was skyrocketing. Uh, and he had so many musician mates who, who sadly, you know, took too much and, and overdosed and are no longer here. Um, so it's, yeah, it's something that's definitely not just a modern thing. It's been around for a long time. And Totally, yeah. And there's like, a, I think, yeah, there are like levels of it as well. Cause with obviously something like heroin is something you can die of taking too much of, yeah. you know? And when it obviously kind of like comes to alcohol, there are like, um, especially with like binge drinking culture, there's a lot of like long-term effects. Yeah. Um, but you definitely, um, yeah, you don't see them as much like straight away or there are short-term effects and then like further long-term effects, but you can never really like, you can get sick because it's poisonous, but you can't really like OD on it that many times. It depends how like hectic you get. Yeah, yeah. You get going. Like I definitely know like people who went to my high school and they had 
stories of like having to get their stomach pumped, mm. you know, and they're like 15 or whatever. Um, because that's just like the way the culture is, you know, and that's just like, it's the race of who can get yeah. most fucked up, you know? Yes. Well, well, I grew up in a, in a country town in Queensland where, uh, you know, the only thing, the only thing that you're able to do on weekends is, is drink, smoke or fuck. And, and that was about yeah. it. And I had, yeah. you know, I, I knew so many people who, who it turned into a problem. They would wake up in the morning and they would, they would do a shot, um, mm. for the, on the bottle sitting next to their bed and they had to like to get through the day. That was, mm. um, and you know, these, geez, these people might've been like 16 at the time. And it was like, yeah. oh, bloody hell like um you, you can tell you can tell society is not progressing when you have people like that who almost suicidal in nature um, yeah you know they don't care what what this what this drug that they're using does to them they just want to feel better they just want to feel mm. happy for once yeah. and um god it's scary yeah. that our young people are growing up like that man yeah i think one of the things i thought was like that made me understood that like it wasn't for me was the idea that it never really actually lasted. Yeah. You know, so if you're going to get stoned or whatever, it's like, cool, that sounds fun. But like, it doesn't, it doesn't last. Like yeah. you go back to being you after a while and then yeah. you're back to square one. Like if you don't like you, then it's going to be an endless cycle of you just like going up and then going down, you know, and feeling bad for yourself and then going back to like, normal and then being like okay cool i don't like this either and it's like maybe that's the problem you know yeah exactly. and they think that yeah a lot of people like uh, yeah i've kind of like you know it's been in like a few of my songs as well kind of like just the idea of like people kind of trying to look outside for something that is like inside you know yeah people do that all the time they just go cool like what's my problem and how do i fix it without it's like yeah there's a fundamental problem and yeah like the root just, issue like the root yeah. cause of why you're doing the substances. Mm. And then everyone just goes, well, that's too hard to, to do, you know? Yeah. It's too hard because it's made to be too hard. It's made to be too difficult. It's hard to get support when you need it and the right support. And because you're, you're kind of, you're made to think about all these other things that are so, you're made to think that they're so much more important than they actually are, you know? Like if it's yeah. just like, oh, you have to keep, you know, it's like at the moment with uh, um, with people in Melbourne who are like casual workers, but they might have coronavirus, but because they don't want to lose their jobs, yeah. they have to go and keep working. And it's like, okay, of course, like it's putting you into this corner where you feel like there's no other choice but to just keep doing that. And then someone turns around and says, actually, like working right now is not that important if you can save lives, you know, Yeah. in the exactly. same way that yeah, if you can just like, you know, take a break from whatever the hell is like stressing you out and then actually like try and go to the root of your problems. It's okay to just like do that if it's for your own, you know, mental health or for, yeah, for your own health in general. Yeah, it's just, yeah, a shame that some people feel like they can't, you know, they can't financially take a break, you know, because they might not be, either they don't qualify for the job keeper or the job seeker. Mm -hmm. Um, and they're willing to take that risk because, you know, if they don't, oh crap, they miss, they miss rent and, and whatnot. Um, and I don't think, I don't think the government has, I don't think they've introduced a law here like they have in America where you can't be evicted during this. Uh, don't, don't, don't quote, don't quote me on that, but. Yeah. I think there was a, there was like a freeze maybe earlier okay. in the, in the isolation, but yeah, I'm not really sure. I know that they just after hearing kind of the statistics come out because all these cases in Melbourne, there's just kind of like, well, we have to do something. So they, I think they made it easier for people to receive like hardship payments. Yeah. Which is like a step in the right direction, but also like not cutting job seeker at the same time would probably just be like good as well, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So people could um, feel like, okay, if I do have to stay home, if I do have to like stop being a casual worker, because the health and safety of myself and everyone else in this country is more important than that, you mm -hmm. know, um, then they have like something that they go, cool, I won't just like be struggling all the time, you know, be like looked after a little bit. 
Yeah, mental. Um, now you're you're a big fan of Bob Dylan, actually, aren't you? I very much am. I'm sure there's like right a poster behind, behind you. Yeah, yeah, right behind you. Yeah, that's right. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know too much about his history, but he he was a. Uh, I know he was an avid avid pot user, uh, and he and he did a bit of uh, did a bit of coke in his day. Uh, mm. Probably like every every musician back in back in those times. In the sixties, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, it's like, yeah. yeah. Um, oh, yeah, go on. Um, you mentioned how you try and put some of these topics that we're talking about in your songwriting. Um, do you, as an artist, do you feel like you have a, a kind of uh, responsibility, for lack of a better word, to, to kind of approach these topics? I feel like for myself, it's like, I have like a self responsibility to be honest yeah. to like my reflection of the world and the way I see it, because like you will, like it's sometimes it's difficult to have these conversations um, with people sometimes where you say like, yeah, where someone just might go like, oh, so why don't you drink or blah, blah, blah. And sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, I'm sick of like answering that question. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Why should I have, you know, to do it a million times or whatever. And uh, sometimes it's just easier to like find a succinct way to put it into a song yeah and say if you could experience this you might get closer to understanding why i am the way i am if that makes yeah. sense. and so yeah. yeah my songwriting will always just be a reflection of like the way i see the world um and maybe like yeah the way i want things to be in a way and so that's kind of fulfilling my responsible you know, way of thinking like, okay, cool. If I'm honest about that, then no one can really, yeah, no one can really be like, oh, you lied about this. So you said this or that, or, you know, and if anyone it's more just like as well, like there's a difference between expressing yourself artistically and trying to make a point and then being able to have like a proper conversation about something, which is if your song can trigger a conversation about it, then it's even better, you know? Yeah. But I know with like, uh, even with like Bob Dylan, there's those, you know, there's bits in the sixties where he was just like on speed and just like, because of the hecticness of his life, like he was, you know, recording um, all of these albums so quickly and touring so much. And he was kind of one of the, I mean, yeah, obviously like people had done it before, but he was one of those he was like at the zeitgeist at the time or something like that. So yeah. imagine having everyone on you and hating that you've left folk music or whatever. And now you're going electric yeah, yeah, that's right, and yeah. then all that pressure. And then you have to do all these tours and all there's all this pressure to like, keep going and keep going. And he could like, he could um, like match up to it because he was that good, you know, so you were to go cool. I'll just like throw out these like classic albums while I'm just on this like speed thing, you know? Yeah, it was like um, but, Stephen, Stephen King. Um, yeah. uh, he doesn't remember writing a lot of his books uh, uh, because he was just, he, he did that many drugs. Um, his book, uh, Cujo, about the, about okay. the dog, um, he doesn't remember writing that book. Right, um, okay. <laughs> uh, which is uh, uh, mental. Like, that's crazy. Mm. Um, he was just doing, yeah. uh, you know, all so many drugs. He was on, you know, coke, speed, chain smoking, cigarettes, mm. um, and then and then you got to. That makes you think. Well, if it's do the positives outweigh the negatives? Like, could he have written such incredible pieces without uh, without having you know a bit of substance in his uh, yeah. in his blood? Um, and then I think that translates to a lot of artists. A lot of artists will. Yeah. Or think you know they need to you know be smoking pot or they need to go out for a night and binge drink or, or do something to be able to create mm. masterpieces uh and i think that's yeah when people think they need the, the stuff to be able to work and create i think that gets a little it becomes a crutch that they lean on yeah. a bit too much mm. and that's yeah. that's worrying yeah no there's definitely this idea of like the tortured artist and this is the way you're supposed to be yeah and you, yeah you're supposed to get super fucked up and 
yeah, and it just gets continually perpetuated when we kind of, yeah, we like, we lionize that kind of stuff anyway. And we go like, oh, that was like a magical period. And oh yeah, they just, you know, they have to be doing all these drugs. And it was like, it was just as ubiquitous, I guess, back then as it was now with yeah. like, um, so you had like Bob Dylan, but there was like the Beatles. And when they were playing even in like Hamburg and Berlin and stuff before they ever became like as big as they did become they were on like speed all the time but that was just because someone just was like giving them like uppers and they're just like yeah they didn't understand what that was yeah exactly Um, yeah but that was like that was the uppers and then it was you know alcohol or whatever to to take you down you know and that was was the way they yeah that was the way they um got through like touring life yeah yeah yeah, definitely yeah i think there's that kind of yeah there's a perpetuation of the idea that yeah, that's how you become a genius is to be like super fucked up. And everyone kind of goes, yeah, I want to be as fucked up as so-and-so. So I'm just going to like do those drugs and try and, you know, open my like consciousness or whatever. Yeah. Do you think mental illness with artists is not taken as seriously? Because I know you, you look at, um, you look at people like, like Britney Spears, for instance, who had a very public breakdown um, and was obviously not having a good time. Um, mm-hmm. I think when she had her breakdown, she was only like 23, 24. Um, right. And there were people that were um, hating on her, thinking that she was crazy when she was basically still a kid. And then yeah, um, that was, yeah. Yeah, that was, that was a bit... Right. I, I, look, I look back on it now, I think when I was like a, a teenager and I saw that, I was like, whoa, crazy, Brittany, what's she doing? Yeah. But then I look back on it now and I'm just like, holy crap, poor girl. Yeah. Um, like how cruel, how cruel was it? Yeah. Yeah. Like that's. Yeah. I definitely think like the media perpetuates like an idea of a lack of empathy yeah. for people in those situations because that's the whole thing. Like it's a, it is like a, it's a circus for them and they get to watch like, yeah, there was those like infamous yeah. photos of her like, with the umbrella or whatever and she's smashing the car and she has like a shaved head and it's like that's what they want like that's what feeds exactly you yeah. know the popularity and the clicks and the buying and all that kind of stuff so as much as possible as they can dehumanize someone yeah and perpetuate the yeah the idea that you know they're out of control and this is just the way things are supposed to be or something they like normalize it and you're okay that's cool i guess that's just the way it is you have to be that way to do those things yeah that's um and then you have uh I, I i don't quite know how they you know like uh i was just i think i saw the other day like as i was like scrolling on social media that it was like 30 years since elton john became sober wow which for him was obviously like a very important thing yeah, and i haven't yeah. seen them i haven't seen the movie but I've like watched interviews with him and he was obviously like in a terrible place with drugs. Yeah. I don't think the movie getting... goes into that area of his life too much. Right. Um, I, I haven't watched it, but I saw people's opinions and, and they seem to be dismayed that they kind of glossed over that a bit too much. Yeah. And that's the thing like biopics aren't always going to be. Yeah. Well, that was more of a, a musical to be honest. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I see. So it was like random parts in the movie where they just they just break into song. So it was, yeah, okay, right. Um, like on the street and just breaking into one of his songs, you know. So it wasn't right. it wasn't um, anything like the Queen. Um, yeah, I okay. I see. Went around that, right. which was um, a bit of a shame, but yeah. But yeah, so they do the. I mean, they create this narrative of obviously like, oh, they're better they're better now and everything's better but they still kind of idolize and yeah attach it to some kind of artistic enlightenment yeah like this period was really like exciting but then really when you talk to the person who is now yeah like 30 years over it it, was just like yeah that was yeah they were like i was in terrible pain all the time and this was horrible but everyone loved me and I was selling millions of records and everything, everything was great, you know? So who yeah. are they to complain? But the system teaches you that, yeah, you shouldn't complain about these, you know, these tiny little things 
that are the problems that you have when they want to continue perpetuating the machine, I guess. Yeah, it seems to be like, oh, well, they have all this money, so don't worry, they're fine. Yeah, exactly. You know, and they have the same, they have the same pressures that everyone else has in terms of, um, you know, being signed to record labels and having those kinds of commitments and when it comes to, yeah, being able to say like, no, I need help to fix my problems. You know, someone is going to look at you and be like, well, that doesn't really fit into our like schedule of your release for this next thing. And you're like, well, sorry, I'm going to die if I don't fix this. Yeah. But it's kind of, uh, what's it like, like get into the Greek or something like that. Oh yeah. 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 Where it's like Joan Hill's sole job is to be like, I know how fucked up he is, but my entire job rests on getting him to this concert <laughs> and I don't care what happens. Yeah. Um, that, that movie was eerily similar to, to Russell Brand's actual life. Um, I've, I've, been, I've been following that man for a while now and I've been reading his books. Um, and he, he was a full-blown heroin addict until he was 29. Yeah, I've heard about that. Yeah. Um, That's out and that that was crazy and you know uh, you can think whatever you want about what what his views are and everything but his his journey from being you know that that stone cold addict that didn't have any any hope for life or anything and thought that he was going to be an addict for his entire life to where he is now um yeah shows that it is possible um yeah another at least he got to, yeah at least uh, he kind of got to put that into the film and be like okay yeah. it's kind of like a yeah like a representation thing as well of being like okay this is a story that i know how to tell because it's authentic to me yeah um, exactly and then you can kind of like embellish it but then it's also just like it is this the thing with you know when they make movies about musicians or whatever and they say like oh we need to like find a way to make their drama or exciting or whatever and it's like i remember reading like anthony kiedis's book scar tissue oh, yeah when I was like 13 or something, because I love the chili peppers. And like, you couldn't make half of this shit up. It's in that, yeah. it's in that book, but it's like, you know, good, good trying. Like, but he's yeah. already like, it's so crazy without even having to be like, let's think of something that we can make up. And it's like, you don't even yeah. have to do that. It's, it's wild. You know? Crazy. Um, yeah. uh, ha- do you know the, the former late, show uh, late night show talk host craig ferguson yeah i know him yeah yeah he had um he was one that had a huge battle with with alcohol addiction um and i just i I watched one of his monologues recently on his show where he talks about when he got when he finally got sober it was like when he was like i don't know when he was in his early 20s or something um uh, before he got sober, he remembers, um, yeah, one like New Year's Eve or one Christmas, he woke up um, in in like the top room of a pub that he was obviously at the night before. Um, he woke up covered in piss. Uh, he didn't know whether it was his piss or someone else's piss, um, but he woke up and he was like, you know, uh, this is the lowest point of my entire life. Um, I'm going to go to the London Bridge. Um, and I'm going to jump off of it. I'm going to do that today. I'm going to jump off and yeah. And he was like, I'm going to, I'm going to show them, you know, he didn't know who them was, but he was just in his mind. He's going to show whoever them is. Um, but yeah, he went downstairs and he went to leave and the the publican, the owner of the pub, who, who was also a bit of a drinker, who was sleeping behind the bar at that point, he saw Craig uh, go to leave and he was like, Oh, where are you going, man? It's, it's Christmas. You know, he's like, oh, I'm, I'm going back up to Scotland to see my family. And he was like, well, there's no buses. There's no transport. You can't get up there today. Come sit down with me and have a, a Christmas drink of sherry or whatever. Um, so lo and behold, he had a drink of sherry and he ended up drinking the entire day and forgot to kill himself. Right. And and then I think, yeah, he went on he went on tr- drinking for a while after that and then eventually got um, eventually got sober um yeah. so it's like it was the alcohol that saved him from killing himself yeah, so, he, wow. so he so he needed the alcohol to keep living basically mm. so it became yeah. it definitely became a crutch um mm. and, I, and i've been yeah i've been looking at a lot of those stories of late and kind of 
yeah, just seeing seeing these people and seeing their battles with it and how they got through it and like, holy crap, man, it's such a sad world for if people fall into that. Like, yeah. I, I don't know what. Yeah, obviously society is not going down a good route when you have. Mm. Um, and it was pretty young at the time as well, so right. it's just yeah. yeah. I feel like that kind of thing in particular, that idea of like, I must do this because my life is like I'm suffering right now, so I must yeah. fix that. And then it becomes this, yeah, like this cycle every day is something that I've definitely witnessed, mm. um, like firsthand with my with my brother, um, which is yeah, it's that kind of crazy thing where it's like you just can't stop and there's no yeah. way to stop. And I realized like when I was 15 or 16 or something like that, it was probably like one of the most like poignant times of my life that I can like put down to me kind of like losing, like in a way I was like losing faith in humanity in a certain way or losing part of that. Um, but also kind of understanding that I couldn't control people was once when my yeah my brother was like he was like sober which was great because he like um you know there'd been a lot going on and we finally like go to shit together and that was great and then we would in like the the summer holidays the school holidays and stuff like that we would go hang out um and we did and he he was living in his own place um still kind of just like getting by and we would go to his mom's house it wasn't very far away and i think maybe I got like super fucked up that weekend and that was really fun for me or yeah. whatever, but he was like, he was sober and that was like his thing that he was doing. Um, mm. And kind of by the end of it, I was, you know, it's like, you, you know, I was very proud of him. And that was kind of like the last time I was going to see him before I went back to school for like the new year or whatever. And I was like, yeah. cool. Like, you know, I had this idea in my mind that, he had fixed these problems or whatever, like, and everything was fine, you know? Yeah. And so I was under this like complete illusion that the next time I saw him, everything would be as good as it was at that particular moment, you know? And then I got like a, a text from like his like ex-girlfriend who he was still like friends with at the time and I was friends with. And she was like, yeah, he's like started drinking again. And it just like broke my heart. Like I'd never had that. I'd never had that idea of being so invested in someone else's well-being in that way yeah. and being like, oh, he's finally like, you know, solved these problems or fixed them or, you know, whatever. And I was just like, damn, that like, it like ruined me as like a 15 or 16 year old, you know, and just being like, I don't know how to deal with this, but I'm like, I'm so disappointed, <laughs> but I realized that I couldn't control the situation i couldn't fix it yeah and maybe like yeah from um yeah even before that but on that um from then and onwards like for the next like yeah 10 years or so um that it's been since that um it's been the same thing and it's been constant and it's it never goes away like i can leave the situation like it triggers me a lot yeah. so i know that i have to be like there are limits to my commitment as a um, as a human being to my relationship with my brother, which is so fucked up. But I have to like I have to limit that for my own safety, you know, yeah. my own like well yeah. because it's so triggering. But I can leave and then I come back, you know. And especially it's not even in like a mental way. It's just even just like I'll go back to his mum's house where he lives, and it'll be like I'm fifteen and nothing has changed, even though mm. I'm 25 and my life is completely different than it was when I was 15. And that's something that I'm happy about for me, but then simultaneously so sad and disappointed in that literally nothing has changed there, you know? And it's so difficult, you know, because I don't, I never know what to do. Like, and that's the thing, like, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a, um, you know, a psychologist and I'm not an alcohol or addiction like expert or anything. Yeah. So that's the only way I know how to deal with it, which I think is, it's not healthy, but, but like nothing is in that situation. Like nothing yeah. can really be that healthy because I don't want to, what it does is it, it like sucks you in and you become an enabler whether you want to or not. 
Yeah, because you're like, you know, in those situations, those kinds of people, they find a way to, to make you an enabler for them because they need to be surrounded by enablers, you know? And if you're going to be a point of difference, then it just makes the situation more intense or they end up hating themselves more. And it's like, well, I don't want to, I don't want to say horrible things that I feel um, are valid because that's just going to make things worse. Yeah. So you know how to do is like detach, you know? Yeah. And it's, it's so sad, but I have to do that, you know? Yeah. So that's my like experience with that kind of stuff on such like a, when you were telling that story, I was like, yep, I completely understand that because I've had someone on the phone, like tell me that, like, I don't think my brother's ever, I don't think he's necessarily ever been a suicidal person, but he's always just kind of been like, yeah, it's this like constant suffering with no want because because he's a musician as well, you know, and he plays music and he writes songs. Yeah. But he's always kind of like, um, he's always asking me because he's not really part of the music scene at the moment and hasn't really been part of the music scene. Like I think um, when he was younger, there were, he was definitely in like parts of like the local scene down South where he was kind of from and I played gigs and, and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, when he asks me, um, how to help him get into the music industry like now I kind of say well okay there's a bunch of different stuff you can do and that all kind of just falls on deaf ears because number one step is you need to fix the problems you have because yeah they lack a rock in a lake they permeate the entire um structure from like the top down because if you there's no way anyone will want to have you play a gig if you're completely unreliable, um, there's no way me as an honest person could ever say like, oh yeah, you should get my brother to play and his band. Because like, I know how um, great it could be, but if everything goes wrong, then everything goes wrong, you know? And I yeah. also don't want to put myself on the the chopping block for being like, yes, I can vouch for this person when I um, could, you know, tell so many stories about why I couldn't possibly trust playing a gig with my brother or having my brother in my band or him wanting to him wanting me to be in his band and me having to say no I I don't want to be in your band until Mm. you get your shit together you know and he'll kind of just he'll act like he'll act like it's a small thing to fix and they kind of just ignore it and be like okay cool well I want to do all these things that I want to rehearse and and blah 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 but he forgets like the fundamental thing that goes okay cool if you can't help yourself then I'm going to walk into this situation and I'm going to know it's going to be the exact same thing every time. And I'm going to want to get out of there because it's going to drive me insane. You know? yeah. So it makes it really difficult, you know, when your brother just like asks yeah. for your help, but you know, it's, it's kind of, it's serving a purpose of distraction. Yeah. Like yeah. the idea of saying like, Oh, this is the way you can help me. And I go, yeah, but like, you have to help yourself first and I have to be able to see that before I ever have any kind of confidence in you as a person. And it's mm. so crazy that that has to like be the way that things are. You know? Jeez. And that'd be hard because it's family as well. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, I love my family, but I also know um, in all the different experiences with my family, like what triggers me and what I need to, to have uh, in a way kind of it goes back to that kind of controlling thing where it's like I can't control anyone else or anyone else's actions but if I can control my own and kind of mitigate all of these like triggering things in my life then I can make myself a less yeah a less like triggered and a kind of off the wall person because there's not so much like crazy shit going on in my life <laughs> that drives me insane so but that's the thing, you have to do it yourself. You have to look after yeah. yourself. Yeah. You know? but, how, yeah. So, uh, I was just going to ask you, how have you found this whole like not drinking thing? And what's, what was your like previous, you know, situation and then going, going in the dry July and all that? Yeah. Um, yeah. So as I mentioned before, you know, I grew up in a country town where it's like, 
there's not much to bloody do on the weekends and after school and everything. So that that culture of, you know, smoking and drinking, acting out and whatnot, that was, um, that you know, that was put into me at a young age. Um, and I think as, as someone who has always kind of uh, wanted to be the centre of attention, I, I would always, you know, try and, you know, act out to, to pull a laugh from my mates and whatnot. Um, and that, you know, that acting out is just a, um, that's another um, consequence of, of mental illness. Um, and, and yeah, so it's, so at that age, you know, I think, I think I found, I think I found pot when I was like maybe 16, 17. And I was like, holy crap, this is the best feeling ever. You know, it was like awesome to, to, you know, go to a mate's place and just get absolutely blitzed for four days on end, whatever, for the entire weekend. Um, you know, it was better than going home to like, you know, my, my, my dad and my brother who were pretty traditional and, and we have very differing personalities and whatnot. Um, but, you know, using, you know, weirdly enough, using substances and keeping to use those just uh, caused the, the rift in our family to grow. Because um, obviously my dad didn't want me to turn out how, how my mother turned out. Um, a lot of drinking in their marriage and whatnot. And obviously whenever he saw me having a drink or whatnot, it was hard not to, to, to think of, think of my mom. So I think that's why he was always a bit, um, yeah, a bit upset whenever I would, you know, come home staggering or whatnot. Um, so I was like, yeah. And then, then of late, I've kind of, yeah, started reflecting on that a bit and looking back on that. And I was like, uh, okay, well, why was I doing that? And then, yeah, starting to look at the root problems, as we said before, um, because yeah, you can, you can do a, you can do a month of sobriety and whatnot. And that, and that's cool. And that's like, oh yeah, nice. You did a month of sobriety, but if you're not self-reflecting and if you're not looking at the, uh, the root causes of why you're using those substances, then it's, it's wasteful. Um, uh, we, we talked about how, you know, the dry, dry July and how it's just, it's a bit of a trend for a lot of people. Um, mm -hmm. People will do it and be like, ha cool. You know, I did a, did a month of month of sobriety and then bam, mm -hmm. immediately get back on it and, and not look at why they were drinking heavily or doing those substances. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's what I'm trying to do. I don't want to end up like a, you know, in my, in my old age, still having these problems. I'd like to sort it out early. Um, so I have, you know, I have realized that, um, you know, my acting out and my substance abuse has caused me to, to lose relationships, um, lose, you know, opportunities. Um, you know, I, I say a lot of stuff that I don't, like, I don't, well, not so much nowadays, but I remember in my early years, I would just like not think before I would say um, and just say it because, you know, it would it would give my mates a laugh or whatever. Mm. And, you know, that was like uh, another addiction problem, you know, craving that attention and, and whatnot. Yeah. Um, so that's something that I'm trying to, yeah, sort of sort out of late. And as I'm sorting it out, I can see how much of a problem it is for my other mates and whatnot. Um, yeah. I've, I've still got a lot of friends back in Queensland who, who, who definitely don't realize they have a drinking problem. You know, it's, um, mm. especially, yeah, especially back in, you know, Queensland, the, the pub culture is even greater than here. Yeah. Mm. Um, and everyone, you know, they, they crave going out on the weekend and getting absolutely trashed. And they think, mm. I think just because they don't do it during the week that they don't have a problem. And that's, yeah. Yeah, that's that's a bit scary right there. Yeah, no, it's such a problem as well. And it like it the way it permeates in all these different things as well is like it's all you know, it's always about trying to take responsibility. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do of like, as well. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, which is great. Yeah. Like like congratulations, like in like not just like doing it, but also like learning yeah. something while you're doing it. Because obviously, yeah, some people do just like think like well they, they do a bet or whatever, you know, with their friends or Try yeah. and make it a thing, and it's, yeah, it's like a, it's a fun oh. thing. They don't take it seriously. Yeah, and it's, it's like, like a little quirky oh, fun no. thing. Oh, look at this! Exactly. Yeah. yeah, and they're supposed to. Yeah, they're supposed to really want to drink, but they're just not allowed to. And it's like, yeah. well, what's you have freedom to do whatever you want, but also it's like, you know, what's the purpose of what you're doing? But yeah, yeah, it, 
I think in, yeah, in a broader sense, it does tie into the kind of allowing, um, especially like, yeah, like men in the music industry to be able to have, to be able to, to um, make decisions and not have to think about the repercussions or consequences yeah. of them. Um, and yeah, I think that you often find that that's what happens when people are apologizing for, you know, shitty or things that they've done um, in situations that, you know, we've seen time and time again, um, yeah. that a lot of that is like, yes, I have a lot of issues that I need to look at. And it's kind of just like, yeah, there's an idea of complacency and just pushing that along and saying, oh, I won't deal with that tonight. We won't deal with this problem. And it perpetuates itself. And yeah, you see people just being able to do whatever, just get pissed and do whatever the hell they want. And yeah. then the consequences aren't dealt with at all. And they're able to get away with, with everything. And yeah. then you turn it around and it's all suddenly like, it's all there and it's all falling down on you. Your entire life is yeah. like crumbling because of some shit that you decided not to take seriously in your life and like look after it. But um, yeah, I definitely think there's a need not to not to okay those things because like okay you, your actions because of your addictions but yeah be willing to take seriously someone's want to change their actions as well yeah. you know so it's like you can't be naive about saying yes i'm gonna quit and knowing that that's not quitting the first time is never quitting or whatever yeah. you know and they that's one of the things that they would probably teach you um, which is a valuable lesson is not to invest so much into the success of other people in yeah. that way, because they'll always end up disappointing you because your standards are just so high when their problems are, are so difficult to deal with. You know? how, how do you think we get past this as a, as a generation? Do you think, do you think there's a solution that we, that we can stop our young people from, from ever, you know, getting into this, or at least they, they realize, you know, why they would, be doing substances and whatnot uh, well like i'm not sure what the statistics are at all but i know that it's kind of it's really weird because you find that you know um you know the government or whoever will start blaming young people for not contributing enough money into the economy because they don't buy they don't go to bars and buy alcohol and support businesses in that way but they go to bws instead and get something really cheap you know? yeah yeah um and so there's that kind of idea of having um the culture is permeated that is so ingrained that it's an expectation of your economic duty to spend money on alcohol and like you know during the pandemic they didn't shut any bottlers like bottlers were seen as essential <laughs> um because they knew that if they did stop people from buying alcohol, um, I mean, I think um, domestic violence rates already did go up during yeah. the pandemic, yeah. which is disgusting. But um, they knew that that would be exacerbated even more if that situation was like, you had taken someone's crutch away from them on top of that. Mm. So I don't know how we fix it only little bit by little bit, but I, you know, yeah. trying to give people definitely like at venues, giving people an alternative to having to drink all the time and just creating spaces that don't have to be defined by drink specials yeah, or exactly. yeah. alcohol sponsors, these kinds of things and just making that more okay. And I guess that's what I'm trying to do in my, you know, um, in my actions is trying to just normalize those kinds of things and say, cool, like what's the, there's no need for that kind of self-destruction all the time. But I don't go around preaching it to people. I just kind yeah. of think, do what I do and live what I live and be like, cool, if I normalize this in my own life, then maybe people will feel more comfortable about not being, you know, stressed or needing to do this. Yeah, yeah. Life. what is so it? Be the, just, be the change that you want to see in the yeah. world. That's yeah. right, yeah. And it's like, I. It's not even about 
consciously thinking about it. It's just been like, well, I'm just going to do this. It's kind of just being selfish. I mean, like, I'm just going to do this for myself. But hopefully other people will look around and be like, okay, cool. You're doing something good. I can see that. And, you know, and I've had friends who have like in the past couple of years, like they've seen, you know, ways they used to do things and decisions they've made. And like, you know, we all tend to like, um, to where we all tend to have like addictive personalities in certain ways. And so it's if you can kind of transfer your addictive personality from something that's really bad for you to something that can be like better for you. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. And find a way to just be like, become addicted to that, you know, instead, you know, um, but it's good to have seen like some friends and see where they used to be and where they are now. And be like, yeah, that's, you know, I can see that person's happier and I didn't have to personally invest myself yeah. into their success that they found it on their own which is really really happy right? well, i like the idea of trying to cultivate um a, a culture around not drinking and not relying on that so much here in australia um yeah. i think i think that's possible definitely mm. um i yeah i i know that probably from now on at, at any gigs that the australian underground organizers we're going to try and you know push a message that you know you don't have to be you don't have to be fucked up to enjoy mm. uh, enjoy the show yeah. that we put on. Um, Definitely. I think, yeah, just kind of slowly moving towards that and and just slowly moving towards, you know, talking to people and being like, okay, well, if you think you need to use these substances, you know, maybe think about why, you, why you're wanting to use them and, and just, yeah, just talking to people and just explaining mm. and, and... Yeah, and yeah. that can come through like... Uh doing more like all ages events yeah, yeah making things like i remember going to i think it's the one of the only things i've ever been to that was like an alcohol free event which was like eat your greens oh yeah happened and uh, jive was like early early last year or something like that and it was an all ages event and yeah. jive was like yeah we just do there's no alcohol today and i was like sick like oh, because yeah. there was heaps of heaps of like underage people there anyway yeah and yeah. i was like well there's really no need to like um to yeah conflate that idea of like because it was you know and that day was about mental health i think it was yeah, like, sponsored yeah. by um a bunch of those like organizations um which is really like headspace and all that kind of stuff um and it's like cool that's like an important message to put forward and then also to not have it there's no hypocrisy with like oh yes we're going to talk about mental health and headspace but also tonight we're sponsored by x you know <laughs> yeah and there's drink specials and blah 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 blah, blah. so we're actually saying like yeah there's a positive way you can to do stuff like that yeah i know whenever i head to gigs or festivals um you know i always see I, yeah when i went to to laneway festival last year um and the organizers didn't like that i pointed this out in my article about it but as soon as i walk in i just see a sea of 16 year olds who are clearly you know fucked up mm -hmm. not just on alcohol um yeah. and you know the organizers didn't like that i pointed that out in my article but holy crap yeah. that's something that i just could not gloss over because mm. seeing 16 year olds um stumbling around um you know wide-eyed and everything that was like that was like disgusting um yeah and you know i there were clearly people walking around that you could tell were just there to deal drugs um mm. And I thought it was like wildly irresponsible that the the festival yeah. organisers did not have, um, did not have either, you know, I know it might be it might seem a bit too far, but you know, having maybe sniffer dogs or something around just to like weed out those hard drugs, um, mm -hmm. although and then maybe have those kind of pill testing tents as well, um, yeah, exactly. going around as lot because, yeah, look look if you're yeah I mean. If you're over the age of you know 21 and your brain is you know starting to not is, is starting to like fully form and everything i think you know go ahead do whatever you want but you know when you're 16 and and, and your brain is forming like that like i, I wish i didn't uh, do anything like that at that age um because i can tell you know it's it's somewhat affected my brain chemistry um yeah. and then yeah so, so i think yeah it doesn't just yes yeah, doesn't just take you know you and me it takes you know the people in the industry as well who are putting on these events yeah. like you said you know the eat your greens um, event to jive um it definitely be a collective effort to be too yeah 
to a, that's the to thing, a like, yeah. yeah someone has to take like responsibility of that and i think if you're uh, yeah like me like musicians in the industry and stuff like that it's always this kind of idea that we're a little bit more progressive than we actually are when it comes to things like that we're just saying like you know even though the government might you know we have this argument about pill testing or whatever every time yeah. it's like festival season and it's like cool i wouldn't even try and argue with some stupid liberal premier who didn't like pill testing or whatever i would yeah. say well we're just gonna create an environment that is based on like health and looking at your choices to do with that and saying like yeah. we're going to have mental health spaces and we're going to have mental health professionals there so that if people do need help um and obviously yeah with like pill testing it's like even just on a yeah deciding what you're going to put into your body like you don't know what this you don't know what's in this pill or whatever yeah exactly um, yeah. but you're forfeiting it or forfeiting part of it to try and um become more educated which is yeah. like a, gr a great thing so you can't fault people for doing that being like cool um maybe i will just like get this pill tested to figure out what the hell is in the rest of it and then it makes it gives you more information to be able to decide to do something yeah exactly but i think that uh yeah the first basis of that kind of like fear is always to criminalize and to like to beat down and it's always about yeah like sniffer dogs it's always about having the cops or whatever and that stuff just drives you to lie about it to hide it and to make it more secret and more underground so that when yeah. you know someone has taken something and they're overdosing it's like you don't know what they've taken because yeah. no one said what they've taken no one knows about it it's very quiet whether it's just like okay they had a pill tested earlier you might know they might be more educated to be like maybe i won't put whatever the hell else is going to be in that besides to just like the mdma or whatever yeah um, and definitely just yeah on the way in just like just creating yeah definitely in that situation like um you know it's not in the best interest for the cops to want to come in and arrest every 16 year old who's fucked up at laneway but yeah and laneway doesn't want to have to deal with that either but they are also part of the permeating that culture you know? yeah exactly so no but that's like, it's, it's totally valid to point that stuff out like you know in that situation yeah but it, it seems we're moving forward though it seems you know it's not just me that that is becoming aware of, of their problems I, you know i have friends and you said you have friends as well who are who are, who are becoming aware um mm. so, and so yeah, there is a change like, there's a change happening for sure creating those like and yeah it starts from it starts from you and then you permeate with it like without and you have these conversations and then you end up with you know like i've got so many great friends in the music industry who like we have this cool um like support network yeah. yeah i think that's what people need they need this support network that says like how are you going like how is actually things going in your life you know yeah who care about support you network that yeah i think that's, that's yeah. very important i know i know for we one, do, you know yeah um we, i, I we know i had, I had a lot of problems because i didn't have a good support network and i mm. think that's that's very important to have a good community around you you know people yeah. you can talk to people you feel you can rely on people you feel you're mm. you're safe around um yeah. obviously there's a lot of kids out there who don't feel like they can talk to their parents about this stuff because mm. because the way that you know a lot of people are, are raised nowadays it seems like you do any of that and it's you know a smack on the ass or whatever yeah no definitely and i think like yeah it's not necessarily about having to like plan it out but just being like yeah just talking to people and having a good conversation and treating those things that, like just normalizing it normalizing having yeah, exactly. conversations about you know it's okay to make mistakes and it's okay to reflect on those mistakes and i think that's the thing if you if you become too ashamed of the shit things that you've done um if they're just you know shit things that affect yeah. you um and don't necessarily have any effect on anyone else and there's stuff that you need to work on um but eventually they do end up like you know um they end up involving everyone else anyway yeah um, because your friends do care about you and they want you to do well you know 
it's a it's a sick sad world and we're all just trying to figure out how to get through it in our own little way yeah, but uh we're, we're not we're not a we're not alone and, and there's people out there that are that can help and everything yeah definitely no and i feel like if anyone's watching this like i um we prefaced that before but i'm not a mental health expert but um yeah. if people are you know struggling with those kinds of things there are services like health space and beyond blue yeah. um because I know even just like um, talking to friends recently and they want to do like a mental health plan and they want to try and get an appointment sometimes can be really difficult. And I feel yeah. like those what that's what those kind of services are there for. If you need someone to talk to and it's like mm. a mental health professional that you can access on a, on a phone number in an instant. So don't be af afraid or ashamed to like use those services if you need them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, Alexander, it has been an absolute pleasure chatting to you. We've been talking for about an hour now, so uh, good work. <laughs> yeah, we should, did a good job. Uh, we <laughs> should wrap up now. Um, yeah, no, of course. Thank you so much if, for having me. Yeah. I thank you for being on. Um, to anyone who's listening, um, obviously, if you see Alex or I at a gig uh, and you want to come and chat to us about anything, feel free to. Uh, yeah, we're very, we're very open people. That's why we're here talking today and and sharing our experiences. And obviously, yeah, you're not alone. In this there's uh there's people out there there's support networks um just talk just talk about it you're not alone you don't have to deal with this six sad world by yourself and yeah That's right. <laughs> you got it uh brilliant all right alexander thank you very much thank you for watching everybody and we will no see worries. you next time thank you